Hi all you CRM aficionados to episode 15 of the Scrum Dynamics podcast. The mission of the Scrum Dynamics podcast is to help every Microsoft partner and customer use the Scrum framework to successfully implement Dynamics 365. My name's Neil Benson, and I'm joined in this episode by my co-host and all-round Irish Scrum legend, Dermot Ryan, for another listener question and answer session. We're going to be fielding a question from Dick Clark at Ebex about Scrum training and certification options, and from Joel Lindstrom, who is no stranger to CM Audio Podcasts, about splitting stories that are too big for a sprint. We'd love to answer your questions in a future episode. You can either leave us a voicemail on the customary website by visiting customary.com, that's the word customer with a Y on the end, and clicking on the send voicemail button on the right hand side or by visiting the new Scrum for Dynamics 365 group on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is revamping their groups feature, and so to celebrate, we've created a new LinkedIn group just for you. Search for Scrum for Dynamics 365 in the LinkedIn search bar, and you'll find the group. But first, I want to thank our sponsor for this episode, Kingsway Soft. Kingsway Soft is a leading integration solution provider offering software that makes data integration affordable and easy. Thousands of enterprise clients from over 75 countries rely on Kingsway Soft solutions to integrate data between various business applications in order to drive their business efficiency and leverage their information assets. Daniel Kai, the Microsoft MVP and CEO of Kingsway Soft, is one of the expert speakers at the Dynamics 365 User Group Summit in Phoenix in a few weeks. He's delivering a deep dive advanced session on data integration for Dynamics 365 customer engagement on Wednesday morning. Daniel's sessions are so good, it's where George Dubinsky goes to get technical presentation tips. I'll see you there, George. Let's get into it, Dermot. Hi, Dermot. How are you doing? I'm good, thanks, Neil. How are you doing? I'm very well. I've been busy this week preparing for uh, something called Orientation Week, which is the start of our new project that we're kicking off at work. We've got uh, 12 new Scrum team members joining us. So Orientation Week is about helping them get up to speed on our program really quickly. And uh, the Tuesday after that, then we start day one, the sprint one. So Excellent. busy getting that ready. We've got, we've got uh, I think got 19 or 20 different sessions organized throughout the week. It includes um, cheese and wine and escape rooms and morning tea. <laughs> but uh, a good place yeah, to work. Yeah, <laughs> some hard work in there as well, getting the teams up and running as well. Excellent. Fantastic. How have you been? Uh, good, thanks. I've been busy since we last spoke. Uh, I got inspired after our last conversation uh, by you getting your PSM level two. So I went off and did likewise. I did the professional Scrum Master level two exam. And then while I was at it, I followed through and did the professional Scrum product owner exam as well. So You did too? Yeah, so I, I felt really busy that weekend. Wow. Uh, yeah, the professional Scrum product owner exam is really interesting. It gives a, another perspective. As Scrum masters, we sometimes presume to know how a product owner should be thinking, but the exam threw up some real curveballs and really interesting exam. I recommend. That's great because, you know, your role as a, as a Scrum master is to help coach the product owner. So knowing what they should be doing and the, the exam questions they should be able to answer you know, sounds, uh, sounds perfect. That's how I went into it. And um, I was surprised there were some tough questions there. So I'd, I'd recommend any Scrum master uh, to try and study for that exam as well. It'll really give you a new perspective on how the product owner is thinking, especially if you're the one who's supposed to be coaching them. So I'd really recommend it. Speaking of which, Dermot, we've had a great question from Dick Clark. Hi, Neil. Uh, my name is Dick Clark. I'm a consultant uh, with Ebex, and I have a client that is wanting to get Scrum certified. He's a project manager, uh, lives in Chile, actually, but he's trying to uh, figure out a way to... Get Scrum certified either there in Chile, here in the States. Um, it, price isn't a concern for him or timing. He's probably thinking after October. He's found Scrum.org and ScrumAlliance.org, but is is asking us as the partner what we recommend, what the best programs are. Thank you. Dick uh, sent through a question from a client of his who's in Chile. So uh, buenas noches uh, down in Chile. He wants to get Scrum certified, but he's not sure how to go about it and which cert certificate is the best one to do. So it's a really good question. Uh, I remember when I started out on my Scrum journey, I, having worked in Scrum teams for a while, I wasn't sure which certification to get. There are several out there in the market. 
the two main ones are the Certified Scrum Master, uh, CSM, which is by Scrum Alliance. And then you've got the Professional Scrum Master, PSM, which is from scrum.org. So Scrum Alliance, I think it was uh, Ken Schwaber and Jeff Sutherland who set up uh, Scrum Alliance. And later on, That's right. Ken Schwaber split out and created scrum.org as a competing company. So you can think of them both as franchises, but they're really the two leading authorities on Scrum in the world at the moment. Neil, I understand you've got both certificates, is that right? Yeah, that's right. You've got CSM and PSM one. So I was trained as a certified Scrum Master by Mike Cohn in a training class in California back in wow, about really? 2013 or so. And really, really great class. Scrum Alliance kind of sets down the, the syllabus and has trained lots of certified Scrum trainers to deliver that syllabus. Mm -hmm. And you have to sit the two-day training class and then you take a multiple choice online assessment and you get your certificate. So that was how I got started as a certified Scrum Master back in the day. And then more recently, I tried the same kind of certification, the professional Scrum Master with Scrum.org. Very similar assessment in terms of the level and the types of questions. Mm -hmm. Big difference is with Scrum.org, I didn't have to sit a two-day training course with one of their professional scrum trainers right so that was a big difference between the two organizations the scrum alliance requests that you take their training class before you can take their certification exam scrum.org encourages you to do that but doesn't force you to do that okay so if you're somebody who's been practicing as a scrum master and you've got lots of experience but you're not certified and if cost is a consideration then you could just go and do the professional scrum master exam by paying i think it's something like 200 us dollars neil yeah that sounds about right and just by doing, if you have experience, you can just go do that. Whereas with Scrum Alliance for the Certified Scrum Master, you have to do the two days, which in Sydney, I think is $1,500 for the two days. And then you do the exam afterwards. So do, any other differences between the courses, Neil, or between the exams that you can think? Uh, no, that, that, that's it. I think Ken Schreiber split off from Scrum Alliance because he just saw this, like you said, it's a franchise where you have to take the training classes in order to become certified. Mm -hmm. and that was just causing people to you know, take the training even when they didn't need it necessarily. Uh, Ken decided that wasn't a great way to go. So, However, there are some great training courses available from Scrum.org. In fact, they've just launched a new training class called PSM2 mm. to support their new PSM2 certification as well. So yeah. they're both in it to sell lots of training um, and to... Um, to issue certificates. Yeah, I've, I've done both as well, Neil. And to be honest, I found the professional Scrum Master exam to be harder. The questions were a little bit more tricky on the professional Scrum Master exam. And they asked some questions about scaling Scrum, which isn't asked in Certified Scrum Master. That's true, yeah. Which I thought was a bit of a, a trick because scaling Scrum isn't addressed in the Scrum Guide. And the professional Scrum Master exam is supposed to be fully based on the Scrum Guide. So I, I was wondering where they were coming from with that angle. But also, maybe that explains why there are far fewer people certified in professional Scrum Master than there are as a certified Scrum Master. Well, it's also much, much newer as well. So it's only been going for a couple of years, but the, the, the numbers are pretty healthy. But you're right, um, CSM from Scrum Alliance has got a much richer history. So yeah, far more people certified in that mm. track. And also with CSM Scrum Alliance, you have to renew every two years, Neil. That's right. Not, not sit the exam, but you have to pay a subscription fee every two years. Whereas with Scrum.org, once you're certified, you're certified. Tell me about the differences between the... The PSM and, or, or CSM and the product owner. So becoming certified as a Scrum Master and certified as a product owner. What's, what's the key differences you saw there in the recent exam you did? Well, I'd say that 50% of the product owner exam is the very same as the Scrum Master exam, which makes sense. They're both level one exams into Scrum. But with the, the rest of the product owner exam, a lot of it focuses on how the product owner can prioritize the backlog based on value and how do you determine value. Whereas with the Certified Scrum Master, it's more about the logistics and the process of the Scrum framework. So it'll ask you questions like, in a four-week sprint, how long should sprint planning be? Whereas in the product owner exam, it'll be, how should the product owner pr prioritize the product backlog? By value, by cost, and various other measures, and then you have to select the correct answer. So about yep. 50 to 60% of the exam is the same, but the product owner exam delves into more of the responsibilities that a product owner would take. So it's a really good exam to get as well to, to broaden your Scrum knowledge. So coming back to Dick's question then, Dermot, if you were in his position, 
working with a client, presumably his client is a product owner. We, would you recommend the the certified um, Scrum product owner or the professional Scrum product owner exam to one of your clients? Yes, I'd, I'd recommend both. Anyone working in Scrum for a period of time, up to a year, if you're in a good Scrum team with a good Scrum master and good people around you, you will learn quite a lot unknown to yourself. And then after about a year's time, when you go to look at the exam, you'll actually have a lot of that knowledge already. It's just about polishing it. And by reading the Scrum Guide and really understanding the Scrum Guide, you have all the information you need to pass the exam. So I've coached a lot of people when I worked with Unil and KPMG. We coached some of the team and they got their qualification, professional Scrum Master. And yep. the thing I stressed to them was, even though they've been working in Scrum a lot, is to be aware of the terminology in the exam. Questions like a Scrum Master should do something or may do something. They make the difference in the exam. So beware on the semantics. You'll get caught up on it. There's plenty of blogs out there that will coach you on how to pass. So do your research. But really, the Bible is the Scrum Guide. Everything on the exam is in the Scrum Guide. The Scrum Guide isn't that big. I think it's 15 pages, Neil. It's not huge. Um, but the trick That's with right. the Scrum Guide is that every sentence is important. You, you can't speed read it. You really need to understand every sentence in the Scrum Guide and really understand it. If you can do that, you will you will pass the exam. Um, so go back to the Scrum Guide. If you have any questions, the, all the answers are in there. So yeah, if Dick, your uh, client in Chile, if he has a lot of experience already, then I'd recommend going for the professional Scrum Master because you don't need to do the two-day course. So it's cost-effective that way. If you'd like to polish up on your skills, then I also found it with the certified Scrum Master, I really enjoyed the two-day course. You always learn something new in Scrum. And on the course, you met lots of really interesting people who had the same interest in Scrum as well. And it was really fun exercises. The course I did was really interactive. So I found advantages with both. If money and cost is a problem, then professional Scrum Master is the way to go, especially if you have experience. If you don't have experience, that might be a bit difficult. But if you want to polish up in your skills and really learn more, then the Certified Scrum Master two-day course is really good as well. What would you think, Neil? I was just uh, reflecting on your uh, recommendation there to read the Scrum Guide very thoroughly. Do you know what I did, Dermot? I, I read the Scrum Guide aloud and I recorded it and I uploaded it onto SoundCloud. And then I downloaded that, uh, I streamed it on my phone and plugged it into my ears and on my, um, was riding my motorbike on the way to work. Wow. So <laughs> I had about a 30 minute trip and I could get uh, a full copy of the scrum guide. <laughs> it was really weird uh, hearing it read out in my own voice, of course, but uh, if anybody is having trouble sleeping at yeah. night, you can go to <laughs> SoundCloud, look for my name or customary, download <laughs> download the scrum guide being read out. You're now. almost able to recite it backwards now at this stage. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. And then the first question I had in the professional scrum master level two exam was about budgeting which of course isn't covered in the Scrum Guide at all. So that really threw me. So that's the other thing that with scrum.org, you can go to a level two. The questions are a lot more difficult. And in the level one exam, it's really yes, no type questions. Uh, so how long is sprint planning in a four week sprint? You'd be given four answers, you pick one answer. In yeah. the level two exam, they're more situational. So it'd be like in a planning session, something happens what would be the best course of action by the Scrum Master? Again, you'll be given the four answers, but two or three of them may be correct. Which is more correct? So you really have to stop and think about the answers in, in level two and really understand it. So that's a, it's a tough exam, but it's, it's a natural progression. It's a good one to take as well when you've got a few years experience. So Dermot, there's a couple of other agile certification paths. I don't know if you're familiar with any of them. The, I can't remember the name of the organization behind Prince, the Prince 2, the kind of classical project management methodology. They also have a Prince 2 Agile, I think it's called. And there's uh, PMP, the organization behind that certification track, also has an Agile PM certification path. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with either either of those or any others that might be useful to the audience as well. I'm not. I'm aware that they exist. Uh, <laughs> I am Prince 2 certified, but that's Waterfall. But I do know that they've they all do release agile certifications as well. Yeah. But unfortunately, I'm not uh, familiar with them. I'm in the same boat. So a uh, um, slightly related question then. If you were recruiting a scrum master in particular, and he or she didn't have any certifications, would that make a difference to you? Yes and no. <laughs> it's a trick question, Neil. If they demonstrated to me that they'd been working in scrum teams and in the interview, if they really came across as very knowledgeable and 
you and I, Neil, we've been working in Scrum for years now, so we, we can tell the fakers from the makers, I think, at this mm-hmm. stage. If it, they demonstrated that, yes, they have a lot of experience and they can do the job, then I wouldn't say they would need to have the certification. However, if you've been working as a Scrum Master for a year or two, I'd be questioning why you haven't done the certification. Because when you've got a couple of years experience, the level one exam isn't that difficult. And there's no reason at all why somebody shouldn't have done it. I wouldn't hold it against them. No, I wouldn't tire you. Yes, you, if you have the experience, then you have the experience. But I would be questioning why you just didn't go and do it. Yeah. So what, what would you think, Neil? You've done plenty of interviews in your time. Yeah, actually, I just hired a Scrum Master onto my new teams. Uh, Carol, she's fantastic. She has been working with Scrum for about 15 years, and she's got no certifications at all. She was able to recite the four values and the 12 principles of the Agile Manifesto, mm-hmm. and uh, all, similarly, she knew the Scrum Guide backwards. So I had no doubt that she had the the right uh, knowledge of the Scrum Guide, as well as great experience. She said all the right things in the interview. The big difference for us was she said she didn't want to be an agile coach, <laughs> which was some of the other people that we were working with we were agile coaches and really wanted to help an organization transform to become an agile IT organization, for example. That's not what we were looking for. We were looking for a, a hands-on scrum master to lead two scrum mm-hmm. teams. And Carol wanted that role in particular. So really enjoying working with her over the last couple of days and looking forward to a, a great project working with Carol, who's got no scrum certifications. I don't think she's going to do any just because I ask her to, um, but I'll be encouraging the rest of the team to take some. Sounds like she's got all the experience she needs, Neil. Yeah. <laughs> Again, yeah. if she's got the real world experience and has proven that she's done it, then why should she, should she need a certification? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, two different trains of thought there, but it's definitely something I look for when I'm interviewing uh, both developers as well as scrum masters. I don't often get to interview product owners. Those are typically my clients, but uh, I'd love to see more of my clients take scrum courses and the scrum certified product owner exam or or a professional Mm -hmm. product owner exam. That's great. So I think we had another question, Neil, somebody wrote in asking about the differences between squads, guilds, chapters and tribes. Yeah. Do you want to try to tackle that one? Well, this has actually come from Carol. This is my new Scrum Master who told me to d- today, it was actually this morning, she said, we're not going to call them Scrum teams. We're going to call them squads. Is that okay with you? I'm like, yeah, okay, Carol, I'll go with that. <laughs> Why are we calling them squads? And she said it's terminology that she used at her previous organization. It's a, her previous organization, a company called Suncorp, a big financial services organization here in Brisbane, and quite well known for being quite an agile shop. And that's how they organized their their groups. So they had a squad, a tribe, a chapter, and a guild. And I think your current outfit uses those same terms, Dermot. So I thought you could introduce those yes. to us. Yes. So I'm currently working with Commonwealth Bank here in Sydney, and we're using that terminology. My understanding is that this terminology comes from Spotify. Now, Spotify is famous for how well they have implemented Agile and Scrum in particular. Out of that came what was called the Spotify model. And a lot of companies adopted that and that terminology it was oh, squad okay. skills, chapters, and tribes. Now, I did some reading on this as soon as I heard these terms. Oh, what's a guild? What's a chapter? What's a tribe? What I discovered is that Spotify have since come out and said that, don't copy us. Do your own thing. <laughs> there, is no, there is no Spotify model. We just did what worked for us, and you should all do what works for you. But the cat was out of the bag, and everybody's using this terminology now. You won't find this terminology in the Scrum Guide. So I'm not saying it's not Scrum, but at the same time, you're not obliged to use this terminology. If it works for you, fantastic, but you don't have to use it. You can still be practicing Scrum and not use this terminology. Let's go back to the terminology. What does it mean? So squats, yeah. as Carol said. That's a scrum team. You usually use it when you're having scale scrum. So if you have multiple teams working off one product backlog, they will call them squads. So instead of saying five scrum teams, we have five squads. And then that collection of five scrum teams together would be called a tribe. If they're all working off the one product backlog or on the one feature or in the one logical area, you have a tribe of multiple teams. Guilds and chapters, on the other hand, um, Neil, I think you are familiar with chapters and guilds? Well, yeah, the way that Carol explained it to me is that a a chapter might be a a group of people who have a similar specialization. So you might have Dynamics developers who are in different tribes across the organization, but who come together periodically to maybe enhance best practices or to share some stories, not necessarily about the features that they're working on, but about the the way that they're working. And that would be a a chapter of like-minded specialists. And then a guild is 
similar to that, but it's people from different specializations coming together around a particular topic. So it might be, in, in the case of dynamics, it might be around unified service desk or the unified client or around uh, using flow, for example. And those could be people from lots of different squads and tribes from around the organization who are particularly interested in a topic. And the way I've heard it is that those topics don't necessarily need to be related to work either. So it could be a wine tasting uh, guild, or in my case, whiskey tasting guild, just a, a bunch of like-minded people coming together. Great. I, I have to say that since I've been working with this terminology, I, I find it really good, especially with the tribes, because we have multiple tribes and we all have our unique identities because we're working in different logical areas of the business. Right. And within that tribe, we have many scrum teams that are called squads. So the, the terminology does work because the greater tribe uh, takes on an identity. And then we liaise with other tribes and those other tribes also have multiple squads. And then with the guilds and chapters, we have our specialists in certain areas, uh, such like Splunk and App Dynamics, different technologies. They come together and across different teams and different tribes and they will share ideas with each other. So the, yeah. the terminology puts a bit of structure around knowledge transfer and collaboration. And I find it really good actually, to be honest. And does it does it force any kind of scaled scrum, you know, leadership? Is there a lot more meetings and management roles because of it? Well, we're going down a, a path there, Neil. It's another podcast, I think. With scale scrum, yes, it does assist you when you want to scale because you would scale within a tribe. And within that tribe, you could have different teams uh, scaling on different product backlogs. Currently, we have, we're adopting the less model um, in the teams that I look after, uh, which is large scale Scrum. There are other scaling models out there as well, such as SAFE, which is Scaled Agile Framework. It depends on your situation, which scaling model you would use. Uh, but I find with the squads and the tribes terminology in particular, it assists in the structure that you can put in place to scale up. So yeah, it's really interesting stuff. Good. All right, time for our, our next listener question, I think. This is Joel Lindstrom. Here's a question for you. How do you handle long-running development tasks within sprints? So, for example, say you've got maybe a really complex integration or plug-in development or something that doesn't neatly fit within a sprint and doesn't really have production-ready code at the end of the end of the sprint. How do you keep the developers working while you transition between sprints? And how do you how do you break that up within the Scrum methodology? That was a question from Joel. Uh, he wants to know what happens when a user story or product backlog item you're working on is too big for one sprint. How do you handle situations like that, Darren? Right, uh, great question, Joel. This is a question that comes up quite a lot, especially in product backlog refinement sessions. Now, if you, if you remember in a refinement session, that's when the team comes together with the product owner and they break down large user stories into smaller user stories. Um, they try to understand the story to give it an estimate. And it, it has to meet their definition of ready of so that they can accept it into a sprint. But Joel's question is saying is after you've done all that and the story is still really big and it's going to spread across two, three, maybe four sprints before you complete that feature, what do you do? How I coach the teams is I advise them to try and break it down to as small a piece as possible that can be done in a sprint. You don't necessarily have to release at the end of a sprint. The Scrum Guide says that it needs to be potentially releasable. You don't have to release. So if you had a large feature, as Joel alludes to, and you could break it down into multiple small pieces, small stories, and you could complete some of those stories in the first sprint and some in the second sprint, but you don't want to release until the end of the second or third sprint. That's quite okay. So long as the stories that you've done in the first sprint are in a potentially releasable state, you don't have to go back and revisit them or retest them. You can move on to the next stories, the next linked stories. So the work that you do in a sprint should be finished, but collectively you can package them together and make a release after sprint two or sprint three or whenever suits the product owner. So I hope that answers the question, Neil. Do you have some experience around that as well? Yeah. So what I was taught many years ago is to try and split big stories into vertical slices, not horizontal ones. And the example uh, I, I use in my dynamics teams is imagine you have a really complex requirement that's got an entity so there's a hundred fields that you need to lay out in the form you need to configure the views there's some workflows that hang off all of that security roles you have to configure is um, don't think of horizontal slices as being a, a, a user story you can deliver in that first sprint 
by a horizontal slice, I mean, don't just set up the entity and all the fields in, in that entity. Um, set up the entity, a couple of the fields, put them on the form, put them on the views, set up the security rules so that there is a working feature at the end of the first sprint. It may not be finished. It may only have you know 10 or 20% of the functionality that you need, like you said, before you can release it. Uh, so what we're trying to do from front to back is deliver something that can be demonstrated to the product owner at the end of each sprint as a working slice of the functionality, even if it's not complete for that first, second, or even maybe the third sprint. So that's how I think about splitting up my stories vertically rather than horizontally. Yeah, and that's a really good way to look at it, Neil. As long as the stories you're working at in Sprint are finished and the product owner is happy with them, but again, they don't potentially have to release them until maybe two or three sprints time. It's up to the product owner when he or she wants to release that increment. Yeah, um, I've got a question for you, Dermot. It's one I'm thinking about as I think about uh, a week that I'm planning with my team next week. Mm -hmm. One of the sessions we've got coming up is a brainstorming session around our definition of done and definition of ready. Yes. Have you had any experience taking your new teams through that kind of exercise? How did, how, what kind of mechanism do you use to take them through that uh, to, to arrive at your first ever definition of done and definition of ready, given that you've never worked together, mm -hmm. um, you've never started work on any, any increment? Mm. What can you recommend as my course of action? Yeah, so the, the temptation here for a scrum master who's done it many, many times is to go into a new team and just tell them, this is what you're doing for definition of done, definition of ready, which is the wrong thing to do. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but to save time and just get the ball rolling with a new team, it's very tempting to do that. But resist the temptation. The definition of done and definition of ready belongs to the team. The team should be coming up with what that is. So once, what I usually do is I explain what the definition of done is, uh, what the definition of ready is. We usually have a, a lengthy question and answers around that because with new teams, it's the first time they've heard this terminology. They don't know what it means. So I'll go through it. I'll explain what what we expect in our definition already, what we expect in our definition of done. We do some Q&A and then we start small. You don't need a big couple of pages, you, like two or three bullet points just to start off is plenty. So uh, definition already, a story must have an estimate and that you understand what the story is. Uh, that's plenty to get started with. And yep. then you're you're allowed to inspect and adapt. I mean, two of the key uh, principles of, of Scrum is inspect and adapt. Every retro, you have an opportunity to look back at how we ins inspect the process that you used in the previous sprint. And what can we have done better? What can we change for the, the better good of the team? And maybe you can improve the definition already and definition of done. So in the first few sprints, I advise... Start small, understand what you need from your definition ready, definition done, inspect it and adapt it very frequently. And over time, you'll get very, very good at that. And you'll have a bigger definition of done, bigger definition of ready, but one that you can really get through really quick. So start small, but but good is the, is the key there for me, Neil. So you've been through this or you're going through this? Yeah, thanks, Drew. I'm about to go through this. You've worked with me before, so you <laughs> you knew my temptation, which was to dive right in. Hey, guys, I've I've got lots of examples of definition of ready for my dynamics projects in the past. Where do you see this? And I'm going to try and sit back and not do that. The other big thing, uh, we'll not go through it right now. I'll let you know how it goes in a couple of weeks' time. But we're also going to form two squads out of this group of 12 dynamics experts that we've hired and I have no idea how to organize them into two, two different squads. I keep thinking of things in my head. And all I keep coming back to is I have to let them organize themselves. It's the first ever opportunity yes. to exhibit self-organization, which is what I really want them to do. So I'm going to sit back. I'm probably not even going to be in the room. I'm just going to ask them to form two teams. Fantastic and let them figure out who's on which team. I just hope it goes better than uh, whenever I was standing on the sideline as a, as a kid in high school, waiting to be picked for one of the rugby teams, um, which is always an uncomfortable feeling because you're, if you're the last one to be picked, it says something about your ball handling skills. Uh, well, the, the thing with, with this as well, Neil, and back to the definition of done, definition already, is you let the team fail. They will learn from the failures. So if they do a definition of done, definition already, and at the end of the first sprint, they go, oh, we had a really bad definition already. Let's let's improve it. That's a good thing. <laughs> so it, yeah. fa failure is not necessarily a bad thing in Scrum. I just wanted to add there, Neil, as well, with the definition of done and definition of ready, there's also an opportunity to do a social charter. Have Ooh. you guys done that with your new team? No, I've I've heard that. Uh, term, like Carol's mentioned it, actually, but uh, it's not something I've done before. It's not part of the official Scrum guide or mm. training that I've ever done. I, one of the 
posters in our kitchen reminds us to clear out the fridge on a Friday afternoon, <laughs> um, which is a kind of a social charter uh, of, of sorts. I imagine a social charter for a scrum team is filled with those kind of behavioral mm. expectations that the team sets up. Is that right? Yes, it is. And I highly recommend doing one and putting it somewhere visible, just like in the kitchen, like you said, but you know, where people sit. It's really important because it's how the team conduct their business with each other. Uh, so, for example, the team will agree to respect other people's time. And by that, it means you'll turn up on time to the scrum ceremonies. So if your scrum daily stand up is starting at 9.30 p.m. and some people don't rock up until 9.35 or 9.40, well, that's going to delay everybody else. That's going to push back their day by five to ten minutes. So in the social charter, we would have turn up on time for ceremonies. Do not shout over people. If you want to speak, just put your hand up and we'll get to your turn. Again, it's up to the team to come up with the social charter. And again, just like the definition of done and definition already, it tends to start small. And as the team become teammates and really learn how other people work and what other people's irritabilities are, they can come <laughs> up and inspect and adapt that social charter as well. So I highly recommend it. It's something very good. But it's important that the team owns it and that the scrum master or product owner don't dictate what it should be. Because then that's seen as old school project manager telling us what to do. Whereas if the team come up with it themselves and they inspect it and change it themselves over time, they really buy into it and they tend to stick by it. So, yeah, I really recommend trying that next week, Neil. Yeah, it sounds uh, like it would have been really useful, Dermot, on one of the projects that we worked together on. Yes, it would have. (laughs) Yeah, enough said. <laughs> okay, great. Um, and if people want to uh, ask us any more questions, um, there's the usual mechanism, which is it's the send voicemail button on the customer website. So you can visit customer, that's the word customer with a Y in the end, dot com. There's a button on the right hand side that says send voicemail. That's great because we can then play that back in the podcast and everybody can hear your question. The other thing, Dermot, I don't know if I've uh, told you, I've just launched a new Scrum for Dynamics 365 group on LinkedIn. So LinkedIn is about to relaunch its groups feature, which uh, they kind of hid away a couple of years ago. That's coming back. It's coming back into the main application, back into the main mobile application, and the functionality is being revamped. So I wanted to give it a chance to help our listeners out. So that's an open group. You can come and join that, ask your questions. Obviously, we'll try and answer them in that LinkedIn group, but we'll also read out a few on the podcast as well. So you can visit linkedin.com, search groups for It's called Scrum for Dynamics 365. Fantastic. I'm going to sign up, Neil. Thanks for that. Okay. Well, Dermot, this has been another cracking episode. Always great to catch up with you again. I really appreciate your your insight and we'll speak to you soon. Fantastic. Thanks for having me, Neil. Our mission is to help every Dynamics 365 customer and partner succeed with the Scrum framework. If you'd like to learn more about Scrum and gain the Professional Scrum Master Certification from scrum.org, visit crm.audio slash scrum dynamics to get discounted access to the Scrum for Dynamics 365 video course. The course features videos, worksheets, quizzes, and a practice assessment for the PSM Level 1 certification exam. It covers Scrum theory, events, roles, artifacts, as well as lessons learned through real-life Scrum for Dynamics 365 case study projects. Thanks for being part of the CRM Audio audience. You can get discounted access by visiting crm.audio slash scrumdynamics. Dynamics.